Walking a path along the roots of Pikes Peak, you take a fork in the road to the Anselm Society Digital Pub, and inside you find the Anselm Pub Night for the month of May. Yes, I realize that we are now several days into the month of June, but in my defense, scheduling podcasts is very complicated, so uh, cut me a little slack here. This pub night that we're featuring happened on May 27th at St. George's Anglican Church in downtown Colorado Springs. As I've mentioned several times on earlier podcasts, Anselm's theme for the month of May is enchantment. And perhaps no modern writer has done more to re-enchant our world than J.R.R. Tolkien. So his work was the focus of this pub night. That includes the story that is at the heart of this pub night, which we're about to share with you. And that is Smith of Wooten Major. It's a longish short story that Tolkien wrote uh, toward the end of his life. And it gives perhaps the clearest view of Tolkien's view of fairy and how we as moderns should view the ancient stories about fairy. The story is told by a great friend of Anselm, Leslie Bustard. She is an author, publisher, and teacher, and I recommend you find her writing and follow her on social media right after listening to this podcast. As always, you'll hear Leslie tell the story, and then Leslie and I will talk for a few minutes about the story. So with that, the Anselm Society now proudly presents Leslie Bustard retelling the story of Smith of Wooten Major. Enjoy. It's been a delight to be here the past day and a half and to spend time with Brian and his family and we have other things we're looking forward to with Melody and it's been wonderful. So thank you for this welcome and for having us um, here. And we love Anselm Society and now we love it in person and not from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So here is the story of the Smith of Wooten Major by J.R.R. Tolkien. Although I think she said Tolkien. Is that how you did it? Okay. There was a village once, not very long, for those with long memories, not very far away for those with long legs. Wooten Major, it was called, because it was larger than Wooten Minor. It was a remarkable village in its way, being well known in the country round about for the skill of its workers in various crafts but most of all for its cooking. It had a large kitchen, and the master cook was an important person. In the hall, villagers held their meetings and debates and their public feasts and their family gatherings. So the cook was kept very busy, since for all these occasions, he had to provide suitable fare. There was one festival to which all looked forward, for it was the only one held in winter. It went on for a week. And on its last day, at sundown, there was merrymaking called the Feast of Good Children, to which not many were invited. (laughs) No doubt some who deserved to be asked were overlooked. And some who do not were invited by mistake. (laughs) For that is the way of things. However careful those who arrange such matters try to be. In any case, it was largely by chance of birthday that any child came in for the 24 feast, since that was only held once in every 24 years. And only 24 children were invited. For that occasion, the master cook was expected to do his best. And in addition to many other good things, it was the custom for him to make the great cake. By the excellence, or otherwise, of this, his name was chiefly remembered. For a master cook seldom, if ever, lasted long enough in the office to make a second great cake. There came a time, however, when the reigning master cook, to everyone's surprise, since it had never happened before, suddenly announced that he needed a holiday, and he went away, and no one knew where. 
when he returned, he was merrier and often said and did the most laughable things. And he also brought back with him an apprentice. And this astonished the village because he was a mere boy and not from the village at all. People soon became used to seeing him about and called him Prentice, although really his name was Alf. The next surprise came only three years later. One spring morning, the master cook took off his tall white hat and departed. There was quite a stir in the village when Prentice gave this message to people who came to the kitchen. What a thing to do! And without any warning! What is he doing? And what are we going to do without a master cook? He has left no one to take his place. In all their discussions, no one ever thought of making the young apprentice into cook. In the end, for lack of anyone better, they appointed a man of the village who could cook well enough. His name was Noakes. He learned a lot from Prentice by watching him slyly but in due course, the time for the 24 feast drew near, and Noakes had to think about making the great cake. Secretly, he was very worried about it. It was expected that the great cake would have something new and novel and surprising about it and not be a mere repetition of the one before. His chief notion was that it should be very sweet and rich, making it pretty and fairy-like. And he decided that he would stick a little doll on the pinnacle of the middle of the cake, dressed in white with a little wand in her hand, ending in a tinsel star, and fairy queen, written in pink icing around her feet. But when he began preparing the materials for the cake making, he found that he had only, mm, dim memories of what should go inside a cake. So he looked in some old books of recipes left behind by previous cooks. They puzzled him, even when he could make out their handwriting, for they mentioned many things that he had not heard of before, and some, actually, that he had forgotten about and had no time to get. But he thought... He might try one or two of the spices that the boat book spoke of. So he scratched his head and remembered an old black box with several different compartments in which the last cook had once kept secret. And um, I apologize, I lost my place. So we're going to start out another sentence. He scratched his head and remembered an old black box with several different compartments in which the last cook had once kept spices and other things for special cakes. He had not looked at it since he had taken over. But after a search, he found it on a high shelf in the storeroom. But when he opened it, he found there were very few spices left. And the ones that were left were dry and musty. (sighs) But in one compartment in the corner, he discovered a small star, hardly as big as one of our sixpences black-looking, as if it was made of silver, but tarnished. Well, that's funny, he said as he held it up to the light. No, it isn't. Noakes was surprised to hear that happening, and he jumped. What do you mean, young fellow, he said, not much pleased. It isn't funny. What is it? It is fae. It comes from fairy, said Prentice. And what are you going to do with the star, master? Put it in the cake, of course, said the cook. I dare say you've been to children's parties yourself with little trinkets like this that were stirred into the mixture and little coins and whatnot. It amuses the children. But it isn't a trinket, master. It is a fey star, said Prentice. So you said already, snapped the cook. Very well, I'll tell the children. It'll make them laugh. I don't think it will, Master, said Prentice. But it is the right thing to do, quite right. Who do you think you're talking to, said Noakes. In time, the cake was made and baked and iced, mostly by Prentice. 
As you are so set on fairies, I'll let you make the fairy queen, Noakes said to him. Very good, master, he answered. I'll do it if you are too busy. But it was your idea, not mine. It's my place to have the ideas, not yours, said Noakes. At the Feast of the Cakes stood in the middle of a long table inside a ring of 24 candles. Its top rose into a small white mountain, up the sides of which grew little trees glittering with frost. On its summit stood a tiny white figure, glittering as if it was in frost. On its summit, st- I read that, I apologize, so we're gonna read it again. On its summit stood a tiny white figure on one foot, like a snow maiden dancing, and in her hand was a minute wand of ice sparkling with light. The children looked in wide eyes. Can you all do that with me? Wide eyes. <laughs> Think about your most favorite cake. Wide <laughs> eyes. <laughs> And one or two clapped their hands, crying, oh, isn't it pretty? And it's so fairy-like. Mm, that delighted the cook. But the apprentice looked very displeased. They were both present, the master to cut up the cake with it when the time came, and the apprentice to sharpen the knife and hand it to him. At last, the cook took the knife and stepped up to the table. I should tell you, my dears, he said, that inside this lovely icing, there is a cake made of many nice things to eat, but also stirred well in there are many little pretty trinkets and coins and whatnot. And I'm told that it is lucky to find one in your slice. There are 24 trinkets in the cake, so there should be one for each of you. If the fairy queen plays fair, you each will get one. But she doesn't always do so. She doesn't always play fair. She's a tricky little creature. You ask, Mr. Prentice. The apprentice turned away and studied the faces of the children. No, I am forgetting, said the cook. There are 25 this evening. There's also a little star, a special magic one, or so Mr. Prentice says. So be careful, if you break one of your pretty front teeth on it, the magic star won't mend it. But I expect it's a specially lucky thing to find all the same. And it was a good cake, and no one had any fault to find with it, except, and this is worth finding fault with, except it was no bigger than was needed. When it was all cut up, there was a large slice for each of the children, but nothing left over for coming again. No seconds. The slices soon disappeared, and every now and then, a trinket or a coin was discovered. Some found one, some found two, and hmm, several found none. For that is the way luck goes, right? Whether there is a doll with a wand on the cake or not. But when the cake was all eaten, there was no sign of the magic star. Bless me, said the cook. Then it can't have been made of silver after all. It must have melted. Or perhaps Mr. Prentice was right, and it was really magical. And it's just vanished and gone back to fairyland. Not a nice trick to play, I don't think. He looked at Prentice with a smirk. Can you all do a smirk? What's your smirk going to be? Yeah, like, <laughs> you have no idea what you're talking about. And Prentice looked at him with dark eyes. So now well, we need to look with dark eyes. Like, I don't like you. And he did not smile at all. At the same time, all the same, I mean, all the same, the silver star was indeed a fae star. The apprentice was not one to make mistakes about things of that sort. What had happened was that one of the boys at the feast had swallowed it without ever noticing it. Although, he had found a silver coin in his slice and had given it to Nell, the little girl who was sitting next to him. She had looked so disappointed that she had not found a trinket that he gave her his, his little coin. I know, (laughs) what a good guy. He sometimes wondered what had really become of the star, and he did not know that it remained in him, tucked away in some place where it could not be felt. For that is what was intended to do. There it waited for a long time until the day came. 
The feast had been in midwinter, and now it was June. The boy got up before dawn, for he did not wish to sleep. It was his 10th birthday. And he heard the dawn song of the birds beginning, growing as it came towards him until it rushed over him, filling all the land around the house, passed on like a wave of music into the west as the sun rose above the rim of the world. It reminds me of fairy, he heard himself say, but in fairy, the people sing too. And then he began to sing, high and clear, in strange words that he actually seemed to know by heart. And in that moment, the star fell out of his mouth, and he caught it in his open hand. And it was bright silver now, glistening in the sunlight. But it quivered, and it rose a little, as if it was about to fly away. And without thinking, he clapped his hand to his head, And there the star stayed in the middle of his forehead, and he wore it for many years. Few people in the village noticed it, though it was not invisible to attentive eyes. But it became part of his face, and it did not usually shine at all. Some of its light passed into his eyes, and his voice, which had begun to grow beautiful as soon as the star came to him, and it became more beautiful as he grew up. People liked to hear him speak, even if it was no more than good morning. He became well known all about the country, not only in his own village, but in many others round about, for he was good at his workmanship. His father was a smith, and he followed him in his craft, and he bettered it. Smithson, he was called, while his father was still alive, and then just Smith. For by that time, he was the best smith between Far Easton and the West Wood. And he could make all kinds of things of iron in his smithy. Most of them, of course, were plain and useful, meant for daily needs. Farm tools, carpenter tools, kitchen tools, pots and pans, bars and bolts, and hinges, pot hooks, fire dogs, and horseshoes, and the like. They were strong and lasting, but also They had a grace about them, being shapely in their kind, good to handle, and good to look at. But some things, when he had time, he made for delight. And they were beautiful, for he could work iron into wonderful forms that looked as light and delicate as a spray of leaves and blossoms, but kept the stern strength of iron or seemed even stronger. Few could pass by one of the gates or lattices that he made without stopping to admire it. No one could pass through it once it was shut. He sang when he was making things of this sort, and when Smith began to sing, those nearby stopped their work and came to the smithy to listen. That was all the most people knew about him, but there was more to know, for Smith became acquainted with fairy, and some regions of it he knew as well as any mortal can. His wife was, who do you think? Nell, the young girl he had given the silver coin to. And his daughter was Nan, and his son was Ned. From them, it could not have been kept secret anyway, for they sometimes saw the star shining in his forehead. And when he came back from one of his long walks, he could take a loan now and then in the evening, or when he returned from the journey, they could see the star shining in his forehead. From time to time, he would go off, sometimes walking, sometimes riding, and it was generally supposed that it was to buy business supplies, but he had business of another kind in ferry. At first, he walked for the most part quietly among the lesser folk and the gentler creatures in the woods and meads of fair valleys, and by the bright waters in which at night strange stars shone. In longer journeys, he had seen things of both beauty and terror that he could not clearly remember nor report to his friends, though he knew that they dwelt deep, deep in his heart. But some things he did not forget, and they remained in his mind as wonders and mysteries that he often recalled, 
like when he stood beside the sea of windless storm, or when he saw the king's tree. On one such journey, climbing into the outer mountains, he came to a deep dale among them, and at its bottom lay a lake, calm and unruffled, though a breeze stirred the woods that surrounded it. In that dale, the light was like a red sunset, but the light came up from the lake. From a low cliff that overhung it, he looked down, and it seemed that he could see to an immeasurable depth. And there he beheld strange shapes of flame bending and branching and wavering like great weeds in a sea dingle, or fiery creatures went to and fro among them. Filled with wonder, he went down to the water's edge and tried it with his foot. But it was not water. It was harder than stone and sleeker than glass. He stepped on it and fell heavily, and a ringing boom ran across the lake and echoed in its shores. At once, the breeze rose in a wild wind, roaring like a great beast, and it swept him up and hung him there on the shore, and then flung him out, and it drove him up the slopes, whirling and falling like a dead leaf. He put his arms about the stem of a young birch and clung to it, and the wind wrestled fiercely with them, trying to tear him away. But the birch was bent down to the ground by the blast and enclosed him in the branches. When at last the wind passed on, he rose and he saw that the birch was naked, and it was stripped of every leaf, and it wept, and tears fell from its branches like rain. He set his hand upon the white bark, saying, blessed be the birch. What can I do to make amends or give thanks? He felt the answer of the tree pass up from his hand. Nothing, it said. Go away. <laughs> the, the wind is hunting you. You do not belong here. Go away and never return. As he climbed back out of that dale, he felt the tears of the birch trickle down his face, and they were bitter on his lips. His heart was saddened as he went on his long road, and for some time he did not enter fairy again. But he could not forsake it, and when he returned, his desire was still stronger to go deep into the land. At last he found a road through the outer mountains, and he went on till he came to the inner mountains, and they were high and sheer and daunting. Yet in the end he found a pass that he could scale, and upon a day of days, greatly daring, he came through a narrow cleft and looked down, though he did not know it, into the Vale of Evermorn where the green surpasses the green of the meads of outer fairy, as outer fairy they surpass ours in the springtime. There the air is so lucid that eyes can see the red tongues of birds as they sing on the trees upon the far side of the valley, though that it is very wide and the birds are no greater than wrens. On the inner side of the mountains went down in long slopes, filled with the sound of bubbling waterfalls, and in great delight he hastened on. As he set foot upon the grass of the vale, he heard Elvin's voice singing, and on a lawn beside a river bright with lilies, he came upon many maidens dancing. The speed and the grace and the ever-changing modes of their mountain movements enchanted him, and he stepped forward towards their ring. Then suddenly they stood still, and a young maiden with flowing hair and a kilted skirt came out to meet him. She laughed as she spoke to him, saying, you are becoming very bold, Starbrow, are you not? Have you no fear what the queen might say if she knew of this? He was abashed, but she smiled as she spoke again. Come, now that you are here, you shall dance with me. And she took his hand and led him into the ring. There they danced together, and for a while he knew 
what it was to have the swiftness and the power and the joy to accompany her for a while. But soon, as it seemed, they halted again, and she stopped and took up a white flower from before her feet, and she set it in his hair. Farewell now, she said. Maybe we shall meet again by the queen's leave. When he came to his own house, his daughter ran out and greeted him with delight. He had returned sooner than was expected, but none too soon for those that awaited him. Daddy, she cried, where have you been? Your star is shining so bright. Then Nell took him by the hand and said, where have you been and what have you seen? There is a flower in your hair. The flower did not wither nor grow dim, and they kept it as a secret and a treasure. The smith made a little casket with the key for it, and there they lay it, and it was handed down for many generations in his kin. And those who inherited the key would at times open the casket and look long at the living flower. The years did not halt in the village. Many now had passed. At the children's feast, when he received the star, the smith was not yet 10 years old. Then came another 24 feast, by which time Prentice had become master cook and had chosen a new apprentice named Harper. 12 years later, the smith had returned, when the smith had returned with the living flower, and now another children's 24 feast was due in the winter to come. One day in that year, Smith was walking in the woods of Alter Ferry, and it was autumn. Golden leaves were on the boughs, and red leaves were on the ground. Footsteps came behind him, but he did not heed them or turn around, for he was deep in thought. On that visit, he had received a summons and had made a far journey. Longer, it seemed to him, than any he had yet made. He was guided and guarded, but he had little memory of the ways that he had taken, for often he had been blindfolded by mist or by shadow, until at last he came to a high place under the sky of innumerable stars. There he was brought before the queen herself. She wore no crown and had no throne, She stood there in her majesty and in her glory, and all about her was a great host of shimmering and glittering like the stars above, but she was taller than the points of their great spears, and upon her head there burned a white flame. She made a sign for him to approach, and trembling, he stepped forward. A high, clear trumpet sounded, and behold, they were alone. He stood before her, and he did not kneel in courtesy, for he was dismayed and felt that one so lowly, all gestures were in vain. At length, he looked up and beheld her face and her eyes bent gravely upon him. And he was troubled and amazed, for in that moment he knew her again. The fair maid of the green veil, the dancer at whose feet the flowers sprang, and she smiled, seeing his memory, and drew him towards her, and they spoke long together, for the most part without words, and he learned many things in her thoughts, some of which gave him joy, and others filled him with grief. Then his mind turned back, retracing his life until he came to the day of that children's feast and the coming of the star, and suddenly he saw again that little dancing figure with its wand, and in shame he lowered his eyes from the queen's beauty. But she laughed again, as she had laughed at the veil of Evermorn. Do not be grieved for me, Starbrow, she said, nor too much ashamed of your own folk. Better a little doll, maybe, than no memory of fairy at all. For some, the only glimpse, for some, the awakening. 
Ever since that day, you have desired in your heart to see me, and I have granted your wish. But I can give you no more. Now at farewell, I will make you my messenger. If you meet the king, say to him, the time has come, let him choose. But lady of fairy, he stammered, where then is the king? And the queen answered, if he has not told you, Starbrow, then I may not. But he makes many journeys and may be met in unlikely places. Now kneel at your courtesy. And then he knelt, and she stooped and laid her hand on his head, and a great stillness came upon him. And he seemed to be both in the world and in fairy, and also outside them and surveying them, so that he was at once in bereavement and in ownership and in peace. When after a while the stillness passed, he raised his head and stood up. The dawn was in the sky and the stars were pale and the queen was gone. Far off he heard the echo of a trumpet in the mountains. The high field where he stood was silent and empty and he knew that his way now led back to bereavement. That meeting place was now far behind him and here he was walking among fallen leaves pondering all that he had seen and learned. Footsteps came nearer. Then suddenly a voice said at his side, are you going my way, Starbrow? He started and came out of his thoughts and he saw the man beside him. He was tall and he walked lightly and quickly and he was dressed in all dark green and wore a hood that partially overshadowed his face. The smith was puzzled for only the people of fairy called him Starbrow but he could not remember ever having seen this man before, and yet he felt uneasily as if he should know him. What way are you going, he said. I am going back to your village now, the man answered, and I hope that you are also returning. I am indeed, said the smith. Hmm, let us walk together. But now something has come back to my mind. Before I began my homeward journey, a great lady gave me a message. But we shall soon be passing from fairy, and I do not think I shall ever return. Will you? Will you be returning? Yes, I shall, and you may give me the message. But the message was for the king. Do you know where to find him? I do. What is the message? The lady only asked me to say to him, the time has come, let him choose. I understand. Trouble yourself no farther. They went on then, side by side, in silence, save for the rustle of leaves about their feet. But after a few miles, while they were still within the bounds of fairy, the man halted. He turned towards the smith and threw back his hood. Then the smith knew him. He was Prentice. As the smith still called him in his own mind, But he must be an old man now, for he had been master cook for many years. But here standing under the eaves of the outer wood, he looked like the apprentice of long ago, though there was no gray in his hair nor line in his face. Do you not think, Master Smith, said Prentice, that it is time for you to give up this thing? He was looking now at the smith's friendly eyes, but he lifted his hand and with his forefinger touched the star on his brow. The smith was surprised and drew away angrily. What is that to you, Master Cook, he answered. And why should I do so? Isn't it mine? It came to me. And may a man not keep things that come to him so, at least as a remembrance? Hmm, some things, those that are free gifts and given for remembrance, but others are lent. You have not thought, perhaps, that someone else may need this thing? Hmm, and that is so. Time is pressing. Then the smith was troubled, for he was a generous man, and he remembered with gratitude all that the star had brought to him. Very well, you shall have it, said the smith. And they said no more, and they went on their way back to the village. 
Prentice led him into the storeroom. There he lit a tall candle, and unlocking the cupboard, he took down from the shelf the black box and raised the lid. The smith put his hand to his forehead, and the star came away readily. But he felt a sudden pain, and tears ran down his face. You gave me the star freely, said Prentice. Therefore, the star shall go to anyone that you appoint. The smith was taken aback and did not answer at once. Hmm. Well, he said, hesitating, what about my nephew, Tim? Hmm. Prentice smiled. I agree. Indeed, I had already chosen him. <laughs> Then why did you ask me to choose? The queen wished me to do so. If you had chosen differently, I should have given way. The smith looked long at Prentice. Then suddenly he bowed low. I understand at last, sir, he said. You have done us much honor. Hmm, I have been repaid, said Prentice. Go home now in peace. When the smith reached his own house on the western outskirts of the village, he found his son Ned by the door of the forge. Ned had just locked it, for the day's work was done, and now he stood looking up at the white road by which his father used to return from his journeys. Hearing footsteps, he turned in surprise to see him coming from the village, and he ran forward to meet him. He put his arms out about him in loving welcome. I have been hoping for you since yesterday, Dad, he said. Then looking into his father's face, he said anxiously, Oh, how tired you look. You have walked far, maybe? <sighs> Very far indeed, son. All the way from daybreak to evening. They went into the house together, and it was dark, except for the fire flickering on the hearth. His son lit candles, and for a while they sat by the fire without speaking, for a great weariness and bereavement, bereavement was on the smith. At last he looked around, as if coming to himself, and he said, oh, why are we alone? His son looked hard at him. Why? Mother's over at Minor, at Nan's. It is little lad's second birthday. They hoped you would be there, too. Oh, yes, yes. I ought to have been. Oh, I should have been. Ned, but I was delayed. And I have had matters to think of that put all of everything else out of mind. But I did not forget Tom Ling. He put his hand to his breast and drew out a little wallet of soft leather. I brought him something, a trinket, old Noakes might have called it, but it comes out of fairy, Ned. Out of the wallet, he took a little thing of silver. It was like the smooth stem of a tiny lily, from the top of which grew three delicate flowers, bending down like shapely bells. And bells they were, for when he shook them gently, each flower rang with a clear note. At the sweet sound, the candles flickered, and then for a moment shone with white light. Ned's eyes were wide with wonder. Okay. Get to participate wide with wonder. Are your eyes wide with wonder? You're excited. You're seeing something from fairy. <sighs> He took it with careful fingers and peered into the flowers. This work is a marvel, he said. And dad, there is a scent of bells. A scent that reminds me of, uh, it reminds me of something I know. But I've forgotten it. Yes, the scent comes for a little while after the bells have rung. But don't fear to handle it, Ned. It was made for a babe to play with. You can do no harm, and he can have no harm done to him. The smith put the gift back in the wallet and stowed it away. I'll take it over to Wooten Minor myself tomorrow, he said. Nan and her Tom and mother, they will forgive me, maybe. As for Tom Ling, his time has not yet come for the counting of days and of weeks and of months and of years. That's right. You go, Dad. I'll be glad to go with you. But it will be some time before I can get over to Minor. I wouldn't have gone today even if I hadn't waited for you. There's a lot of work in hand, and more is coming in. Ugh. 
No, no, Smith's son, make it a holiday. The name of grandfather hasn't weakened my arms yet a while. Let the work come. There'll be two pairs of hands to tackle it now, all working days. I shall not be going on journeys again, Ned. Not on long ones, if you understand me. Oh, is that the way it is, Dad? I wondered what had become of the star. That's hard. He took his father's hand. I am grieved for you, but there's good in it too, for this house. Do you know, Master Smith, there is much you can teach me yet, if you have the time, and I do not mean only the working of iron. They had supper together, and long after they had finished, they still sat at the table while the smith told his son of his last journey in ferry and of the other things that came to his mind, but about the choice of the next holder of the star, he said nothing. When the time came for the 24 feast to come around, Smith was there to sing songs and his wife to help with the children. Smith looked at them as they sang and danced, and he thought that they were more beautiful and lovely than they had been in his boyhood. But his eyes were mostly on Tim, a rather plump little boy, clumsy in the dances, but with a sweet voice for singing. At table, he sat silent, watching the sharpening of the knife and the cutting of the cake. Suddenly, he piped up, Oh, dear Mr. Cook, only cut me a small piece. I've eaten so much already. I feel rather full. All right, Tim, said Prentice. I'll cut you a special slice. I think you'll find it goes down easily. Smith watched as Tim ate his cake slowly with evident pleasure. Though when he found no trinket or coin in it, he did look disappointed. But soon a light began to shine in his eyes. And he laughed and he became merry and he sang softly to himself. Then he got up and he began to dance all alone with an odd grace that he had never shown before. And the children all laughed and clapped. I will say goodbye now, the master cook said. Master Harper is quite ready to take over. He is a very good cook. And as you know, he comes from your own village. I shall go back home. I do not think you will miss me. The children said goodbye cheerfully and thanked the cook, who was, in fact, the fairy king. But they thanked him prettily for the beautiful cake. Only little Tim took his hand and said quietly, I'm sorry. In the village, there were, in fact, several families that did miss the master cook for some time, but most people were content. They had had him for a very long time and were not sorry for the change. Hmm. But old Noakes thumped his stick on the floor and said roundly, oh, he's gone at last. I'm glad for one. I never liked him. He was artful, too nimble, you might say. <laughs> the end. Well, thank you very much, and we'll, we'll get set up for the interview portion now. There we go. So let's talk a little bit about this story in general. So I'm a member of the Anselm Society, so obviously I'm a Tolkien nerd. That goes without saying. But I was not really familiar with this story before we started doing this. So why do you, tell us about where this story sits among the rest of Tolkien's works. It is the last published work that he had before he passed away. So it was published in 1967, and he passed away, I think, in 1971, if I'm remembering correctly. So let's talk a little bit about the purpose of this story, if I research this correctly. He wrote this, originally it was gonna be like an introduction to a George MacDonald book, and it kind of turned into something from there, but how did the purpose of the story kind of shape the themes in it? Because that seemed to have a big role in it. You're yes. <laughs> So you're right, he was asked to write the introduction to another printing of the George MacDonald story, The Golden Key. And so, mm, Tolkien did not like The Golden Key. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wait, I thought we all loved The Golden Key. <laughs> but he did not, because he thought 
that George MacDonald was too preachy about fairies. And so he wanted to somehow write in an introduction that would really help people understand the idea of fairy, the idea of fae. And so what is really interesting, and this is a side tangent, what's really interesting is when you read the story, there are two different spellings of fairy in the story. So when Noakes, you know, that cook that you're like, hmm, you don't take fairy seriously, do you? When he's talking about fairy, he's talking maybe like we would think about Disney fairies. I mean, not that he knew about Disney fairies, but you know, kind of what we're thinking about that type of fairy. And they were like the little creatures with the wands. And that was spelled F-A-I-R-Y. When he was talking about fae or fairy or enchantment, he spelled it F-A-E-R-Y. Or it could have been other versions because it comes from French but that was what he put in the story. So his starting point for writing this was he was trying to write the introduction and he really wanted to set out what is fairy. What is this that he has devoted so much of his imagination and life to? And so he started writing the story and it was gonna be called The Great Cake. And a couple of things happened the printing fell apart, like the agent who was doing it, or the publisher, he wasn't working anymore. So that, I guess for Tolkien, that was pretty happy, like, because he wasn't into the story. But it got, because as he was writing the introduction, he started writing this story, but then he took it in a different direction. Like, he ended up writing the story that we just heard. Yeah, and I think that really helps me try to wrap my head around the story, just knowing that he wrote it as sort of a corrective. It's like, no, 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 this is how fairy really is. Exactly. That's exactly what he was doing. Yeah, and you can see this. I, I read somewhere, I think, okay, that uh, it was about Tolkien and C.S. Lewis's reactions to, uh, uh, to Snow White when, it came, when the cartoon came out. So I Lewis kind of gave this little like nuance, like, oh, you know, there's some good things here, some bad things, and, and Tolkien hated it, obviously. I bet. Um, <laughs> so you can you can see that, like you said, with the different spellings, with you know, Noakes, the one who doesn't take very seriously, the Alf sort of chastising, like, no, 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 this isn't a funny thing. This is something different. So what do you think were the main correctives that Tolkien was trying to say, like, if he could have been in a room with George MacDonald, what would have been the key points of his lecture about the things George MacDonald got wrong about the Fae? Hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I, I have some notes, so let me go find them in my notes, because I figured that would be a good question to ask. So, he would want to make sure that George MacDonald and other people, and I think I just said this a little bit. First of all, that George MacDonald was a little bit too preachy and maybe a little too allegorical. And we know what Tolkien thinks about allegory, don't we all know? Um, that no, no allegory. So, and maybe there, that George MacDonald had too much of that. So the idea that he would want people to see truly what fairy is, now remember that's the F-A-E-R-Y version, and I wrote down some of the things that he did say, so I'm going to keep talking until I find it in my notes. Here's one thing that I thought was really fun about this, is when he was talking about the Noakes character, Noakes means foolish one. Isn't that great? Don't you love it how Tolkien in all of his names they all mean something, and I thought that was really fun. So one of the things that he says is the seas, the sun, the moon, the sky, the earth, all things that are in it, tree and bird, water and stone, wine and bread, and mortal man. What fairy is, is all of those things when they are enchanted. And then I had another lovely one that I hope I wrote down, but I'm not finding it. I'm gonna pass that over to you. Well, along the, uh, the topic of names, I'm like 75% sure this is true. Oh, you found your quotation, so I I'll did. give my I'm little- I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I'm gonna share a little bit of uh, pop Anglo-Saxon here. Good. So uh, the character of Alf- I love that. <laughs> <laughs> the character of Alf, I know a lot of you would probably snicker, ah, just like the puppet from the sitcom. No, no, no. no. Alf comes from the Anglo-Saxon word for elf. So for like yes. Alfred comes from the Anglo-Saxon word for like 
Elf, elf Wand or Elf, elf Rod or something like that. So it's actually a cool name. It's not just Batman's butler. But, um, but you, exactly. But uh, you found your, your other uh, Tolkien quotation. It might not have been the exact quotation, but it was something that I wrote. For Tolkien, fairy did not mean a small or large creature. It meant enchantment, magic, enchanted world, where marvelous people do stra- have strange powers of mind, and they will do things for good or for evil. And so he did want this story to be an illustration of all that fairy could be. And so you do, and we did take, I did take a few of the story, some of the little, little stories that are in there. And one of the stories that I just mentioned a little was when he's in some place in the fairy world and he's, I don't remember exactly where he is, but all of a sudden this big elven, like, warriors come over him. And he's like, oh my goodness, what's gonna happen? And I don't think they even pay attention to him. And you're like, you can almost imagine what that would be like in a movie, right? Um, But so they're all like marching over him and you're like, oh, they're not very nice. So that's what I feel like I've learned as I've been reading this story and thinking more about even other things that I've read of, of Tolkien's that fairy isn't necessarily pretty and sweet. There's an awfulness to it. Not awful as in bad, but awfulness like as in there's something there that I need to be careful about. But there's also a magical enchantment to it. Yeah, and you, you see that at several points in the story where I thought it was really interesting how uh, Smith would have these experiences in fairy. He knew that they were terrible and beautiful but he couldn't communicate them afterwards. Like, it's almost like that when we get into fairy, our words don't quite work. Right. Yeah, and something related to that, hopefully, um, is the, I was just fascinated by outer fairy and like inner fairy. Like, uh, uh, well, I'm just gonna do I that know, right? and then hand the microphone to you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> That's not nice. I agree. I thought that was really crazy. (laughs) Here's something that I was thinking about. Yes, to the outer and inner fairy. I thought it it was really cool. This is what I do, this is what I do love about Tolkien. And I taught um, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings to eighth graders. And um, it was lovely. And then we did Shakespeare, so I was in like literature heaven, but as an Anglophile. And seventh graders, at the same time, I was teaching Chronicles of Narnia, so I was happy all the time. But um, I, we must all feel this way. The way Tolkien puts words together, like the way he describes things, like I just love that so much. But what I found interesting in this story is He's still describing things. He's still making me remember that I love autumn with yellow leaves. And he's reminding me about wind, but he didn't, and he still is helping us see it, but he's not including as many details. I thought that was fascinating. But one of the things I feel like I've taken away that I don't know if this was something he meant to do or not, but I feel like for myself, if I was thinking about being Smith, and I remember reading this a long time ago, from True Spirituality from Francis Schaeffer. And he says something about, can you imagine what would it be like to go to heaven, experience the glory and the freedom and the beauty and Jesus, and then you come back to earth. And what what would that create in you? There would be a bereavement like Smith experienced, there would be a longing, but there would be this like, I have now touched like that eternity that I've been longing for my whole life. You know, like that as C.S. Lewis talks about that longing, that joy, that word that I can't remember how to pronounce. Um, Thank you, I don't know how to say it. But like those things that, you know, you go to the beach and you look at the sunrise, you are looking at the mountain or other things that draw you and you get that feeling, almost that eternity, but that longing to be in beauty. And what would that be like for us to do that going to heaven and then going back to our everyday life? How would that affect how we live our everyday life? And I feel like that we kind of see that a little bit with Smith. Like, he's been experiencing fairy for very many years. I had to keep recounting, rereading the details. Like, wait, he was 10 
and then it's this many years, and then it's this many, <laughs> I'm lost. <laughs> but, so Ned and I kept talking about it. But, you know, he's experiencing beauty, and he's experiencing this, like, eternal spiritual thing that we're not getting to experience. And then he has to go back home, and then the, he returns for the last time. And look at the beautiful interactions between he and his son, and then they're going to go see the rest of their family. And then Prentice is like, we're going to work together from now on. And it's like this, not that they were in conflict, because you never get that feeling in any of it. They all seem to love each other. But there maybe was a longing that, that Ned had because his dad was gone. So I just love that. Like, he's come back from fairy, and he can't put it all into words. There's this joy, there's this bereavement. But now this is, I'm at home, and I'm going to do this ordinary, but we're going to do it together. And it just seemed really beautiful. Yeah, and that's actually a really great place to end on because, I mean, one of the things that I think is really amazing about this story is how it captures so many of the themes from Tolkien and his other writings. Like so they true. Same things about beauty, bereavement, uh, these the sort of hints at a larger world. And I thought sh I was really, really fascinated by how you brought it out in everyone. Now, We'll, we'll all go read it and be proper Tolkien nerds because we've read the whole canon now, right? Exactly. <laughs> all right, Leslie, thank you again. Thank you. And there you have it. Wasn't that great? Leslie's great, isn't she? I, I thought she was just the best. And I, I know I said this on the recording already, but... I thought that story was so interesting. I'm so glad we could share it with you over the podcast. If you're interested in maybe joining us for a future pub night, we're going to have uh, pretty much one a month for the rest of this year. Please uh, visit AntselmSociety.org and find out about it, especially if you're in the Colorado area. Come on, just, just buy tickets. We always have a blast. I'd love to, love to see you there. And as you all can probably tell now, things are winding down at the Anselm Society Digital Pub. The fire's down to embers. You've polished off your final glass, and the customers are trundling home. But before you trundle home, I actually have an announcement. It's, it's a rather exciting announcement, too, especially if you are a visual artist. I see the Anselm Society's yearly conference, the Imagination Redeemed Conference, is coming up this fall. And one of the highlights of the conference every year that I always look forward to is an art gallery, which features artwork from artists actually around the world. Uh, the theme this year is Artists, Stories, and Time. The gallery is looking for submissions that highlight the storytelling role of the artist, focusing on imagery that enfleshes God's narrative about time or explores what we should do with God's gift of time to us. And the gallery is currently accepting submissions. For a little bit more time. So artists, get your artwork ready. Uh, start putting paint on your paintbrushes or whatever you all do. Entries for the in-person gallery and for a digital gallery will be selected for the ex exhibition based on creativity, technical execution, and narrative strength. Some entries will also receive social media promotion. If you're interested in submitting a piece of visual art, the deadline is June 30th. So again, not a whole lot of time, but some time. So get going. If you want to find out more about it, uh, you can find out more information at anselmsociety.org. Again, if you're a visual artist, highly recommend you doing this. I super, super love this gallery at the conference each year, so please consider doing that. And now that we've made that announcement, you can finally trundle home. And as you're trundling home, I hope the visual artists out there are already contemplating their submissions. Uh, once again, Believe to See is a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you next time.